Hi, and welcome to the Midday Market Update for January 19th, 2021. My name is Kevin Hill. As always, here with Michael Vincent. And Michael Vincent, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, my friend. How are you? Welcome, everybody, to the uh, interactive show twice weekly, right? So uh, comments, questions, and on uh, what do we got on LinkedIn and on uh, on Facebook channels for uh, yeah, FreightWave? And we'll get those addressed. Yeah, LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, throw us your, your, your questions, comments, everything else, and we'll take it from there. You can also watch it live on tv.freightwaves.com. Uh, we have an excellent show for you again today, as always, with the news around freight waves here. Uh, and if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, go to freightwaves.com and subscribe there for our new newsletter. It should be dropping just about now, but Andrew Cox will take us around uh, around the world in freight waves and shipping and freight news. And then Zach, our director of uh, freight market intelligence, will talk about the freight markets. Uh, Anthony Smith will talk about economics, Nick Austin about the weather, and then we have a couple outstanding outside guests coming in today. Andrew Lockwood from Setup Global Logistics talking about e-commerce and Final Mile, and then Hunter Worley about uh, hiring and recruiting and logistics these days. How do you feel about that, Michael Vincent? Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I was talking to him uh, late last week, so I think he's got some interesting updates on on what's going on in that uh, that arena. And uh, Andrew Lockwood, always nice to talk to him. I, lo I love the final mile, filing out what's going on there. Uh, should be should be interesting these days, right? That's an interesting space. We've been we've been talking about that quite a bit. Yeah, we'll be talking about it quite a bit today because uh, after the news, Andrew Cox is going to share some of what he's been writing about on the point of sell, which covers the retail supply chain newsletter that he runs here at freight waves and he'll be talking about holiday sales uh e-commerce and also about some bans on on imports and that is a very interesting topic uh, as well definitely but let's jump into the headlines and, and look at port traffic out on uh the, the west coast those ports and kind of what's happening in container traffic with andrew cox what do we have there andrew yeah, hey, Kevin. Uh, so we're going to highlight an article from Greg Miller that went out this morning. He highlighted some of the exorbitant growth rates in port activity and import levels, not only on the West Coast, but in all ports around the country. He did that through a few sonar charts and some of the data we have housed in sonar. So let's take a look at some of those charts. So the first one here is spot rates for containers from China to the U.S. West Coast. They sit at $4,250 per FEU or 40 foot equivalent unit. That's up 173% year over year. And as Steve Ferreira would say, those are just juvenile numbers. You're going to have to add another 1,500 or even 2,000 in surcharges and fees just to get a spot on the ship. So we're less than a month out from Lunar New Year, and there's still no letting up in sight. Volumes and rates continue to climb on the West Coast as well as on the East Coast. So let's have a look at the East Coast for a moment. Spot rates shipped from China to the U.S. East Coast have driven, have driven all the way up to just under 6,000. 5,924 per FEU as of Friday. That's up 100% year over year. Greg also highlights some of the customs filings data available in Sonar. It's important to note that each filing represents a different level of volume, but it is a good telling directional indicator. Nationwide, filing volume was up 12% year over year as of last Thursday, but there is a caveat. Customs filings go into the system only when cargo clears customs, but are accounted for on the date when they arrive in port. Thus, in periods of, of high congestion, like times like this, near-term customs filings may be understated because they will be accounted for later. On that record, U.S. maritime imports have been up year over year since August, and at some times that level has been up as much as 30% like it was in late November. This consistent elevated high level of import volumes, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, is translating into increases in both rail and, uh, and drive van truckload uh, volumes as well. So of the past six months, loaded outbound 40-foot containers on rail from L.A. to Chicago are up 35 percent. Loaded 40-foot containers from the New Jersey, Newport, uh, basic New Jersey, New York port of uh, Elizabeth are up 21 percent to Chicago over the same period. And so on the trucking side, uh, Los Angeles has been a feeder to the rest of the U.S. for many months now in the back half of the year. You can see there uh, that long haul tender volumes out of LA at one point for about three months in the summer from August to October were up double year over year consistently for three months. 
The long haul volumes have retreated since then. They're now up about 30% year over year, but shorter links are now are still up uh, very strong. So city and short hauls are up 81% and 47% respectively. So the market is very hot outside the ports. We have a lot of port activity coming. We still got 32 or 35 ships awaiting, uh, awaiting port space in the San Pedro Bay. A lot of that is retail freight uh, and much of it is going to be put into the system here in the next few weeks. So we've got enough uh, inventory restocking and, and a lot of freight coming into the country to keep the industry moving. So, um, Andrew, what do we what do we what do we make out of all this stuff? Right. There, there's so much at play here when you start looking at this. Right. Because you're talking about retail sales versus uh, uh, industry picking up, et cetera. You're talking about. Uh, a pull forward because of the cycle time and those 32 ships sitting out there at sea and lack of capacity. I think, Kevin, what was it, like 0.8% idle, which is phenomenally low as, as amount of capacity just idle in the world we were talking about just recently. And then that effect, and you just mentioned it here in the last thing, the difference between the long haul and then the city and the, and the short haul, you can see that wave kind of ride across the United States, right? The, these imports hit and you see the long haul go up. And then shortly thereafter, they start seeing the city and so on. But we are seeing some bookings start to taper off, right? It, 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 so as we look forward to this, everybody's still bullish on this? That's what I'm hearing is past Chinese New Year, things are going to remain bullish in the maritime and still keep driving those long hauls and that, that truckload. Well, I can say that the National Retail Federation with their global port tracker, uh, they do that in tandem with Hackett Associates. They're expecting volumes to stay strong and really strong year over year in March, April and May. Those were the three months mm -hmm. of the year where uh, they have much easy comps compared to last year. Th those were the months where the Chinese manufacturing couldn't get back online during that first wave of the coronavirus they dealt with. Mm -hmm. So they're expecting really strong comps through those first uh, few months of the year. I actually have some calls coming up this week with uh, Ben and Daniel Hackett. So I will let you know what they say about the import activity, what they're expecting moving forward. I have a hunch just seeing that long haul volumes uh, decrease so much while import levels are staying high and short and city hauls are staying high. I have a feeling that a lot of that retail freight is losing its time sensitivity and is being shelved and warehoused uh, for either later in the year or just for a time where they can get cheaper cheaper transportation rates. I'm going to ask that question to Ben and Daniel Hackett as well, uh, and I'll come back on Thursday or on Tuesday next week to give you the results. Yeah, excellent stuff, Andrew. I would concur. That uh, seems like there the uh, time sensitivity is, is, is kind of dropping a little bit, which is to be expected, I would think. Yeah, most certainly it is to be expected. I mean, a lot of that freight uh, was delayed, was supposed to, was trying to get here before the Christmas holiday or soon after the Christmas holiday, it's still being delayed. So, you know, a lot of that freight is not going to be needed until the summer or until later in the year. So it makes sense for them to be doing that. So the next story I have for you uh, is about the Biden infrastructure plan, whether they may be able to get it done now with both Senate elections over with and the Senate being split 50-50 and VP Kamala Harris having the deciding vote on any legislation in the case of ties. Democrats do have control of both chambers and the White House, but the, whether the trifecta will be enough to get a long-awaited long-term infrastructure plan package uh, across the bill uh, is still up for debate. Next month, before a joint session before Congress, President-elect Joe Biden plans to lay out his Build Back Better recovery plan that he claims will make historic investments in infrastructure. What parts of the bill may directly affect trucking? Well, we can look at that 2019 bill passed by House Democrats as a starting point. That bill included raising minimum insurance coverage for commercial trucks from 750,000 to 2 million. It also included making driver compliance, safety, and accountability scores, so the CSA scores making those public. They included public funding for truck parking, as well as automa automatic emergency braking requirements and stricter standards for side and rear underride guards. There's also another advantage here that Biden has uh, beyond Democrat control of both Congress, uh, both Senate and the House, and that is his Department of Transportation nominee, P Pete Buttigieg. Mayor Pete uh, will act as the chief salesman for this proposal for both Congress and to the American people. Jeff Davis, Jeff excuse me, Jeff Davis, a policy expert at the Eno Center from Con for Transportation, said that this is the first time we've had someone acting as a DOT secretary coming in with a significant national following. The Biden admin and the U.S. Chamber of Comber Commerce are pushing for this. The Chamber of Commerce is behind the Biden plan. The group, the group la recently launched a Build by the 4th of July campaign to push Congress to get infrastructure legislation done by that date. The group is optimistic, even with a 50-50 split and the House only being separated by five votes, that they can get an infrastructure bill passed. Kevin. Here's a question for everybody. Is 
is I, I know part of the 2019 infrastructure bill was the the raise in insurance levels from I think it was uh, was 750,000 to two million. Uh, what do you think the odds of that returning in any new infrastructure plan would be? Well, I think it would just depend on how much these policymakers are listening to the people that will be affected by these by these laws. Uh, and if they're not listening, then you'll probably see it again. But if they are listening, you'll see a lot of pushback. There was a lot of pushback from both OIDA uh, and, and a lot of the independent drivers that this bill would cripple independent owner operators. So I think if they are listening, and I'm hoping that they are, we may not see that included, um, but we may see other provisions that are included that are damaging as well. So I just hope that this bill has a lot of say from the people that will be affected by the bill uh, in it's making. Yeah, hopefully they will. I, I mean, aren't they supposed to be bringing in like 25 truckers or something like that to be on some to sort of panel that will listen to these type of or give uh, input into these sort of things, Andrew? I haven't heard uh, about that specific um, yeah. group, but they, all, they have been reaching out to uh, TCA and to other the big trade group yeah. here to have it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, the other interesting thing is the appetite for those Republicans, if they can get those people to keep them from filibustering on this type of thing, to actually add more spending in a year or, you know, and we've we spent, what, a couple four trillion dollars on on COVID relief, et cetera. Right. So. Right. It will be difficult to get those Republicans appetite for further deficit spending since we've already done so much of it in the past 12 months. I, I think John Gallagher mentioned in this in his article uh, as well, but I think one of the more more interesting things for infrastructure bill and one of the the, the sweeteners that, that that can be thrown in there that I think that everyone in trucking and transportation and logistics would be all for is public funded truck parking because yeah. we, we have we have such issues with truck parking right now that I, and it's so hard to get new lots off, and new spaces off the ground for whatever reason. I, I think, you know, dedicated uh, funding for increasing truck parking, I think, would be a, a winner for, for the entire industry. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think truckers would get behind that bill, uh, most certainly. I remember Seth Holm and I did some just preliminary research on truck parking last year, and we found that there's about five or six drivers for five or six trucks for every uh, one parking spot each night. So drivers are having to take, you know, a 60 minutes or 90 minutes off of their day just to find parking. That's not inefficient for anybody. So I definitely think they would be behind that. It definitely would. So on LinkedIn here, we have a Sakura Singh. Uh, he's a trainee navigating officer, says, keep it up, guys. Uh, good morning from William Rufo, Rufo uh, Canadian Transportation at Amazon. And then uh, Jake Sohn, uh, business development rep at, I believe, J.B. Hunt here. Uh, it's cut off a little bit. J.O.S. Group, sorry. J.O.S. Group there. Um, talking about industrials and flatbeds, our, our next article is about Dasky and some changes in leadership there and some future plans for 2021. They're talking acquisitions. Yeah, Kevin, Dasky Chairman Brian Bonner said that even though Chris Easter, the CEO that is resigning, will be sorely missed, the company is in a much better shape to handle a departure of this magnitude now than they were a year ago. Over the past year, Dasky has filled out its C-suite, including the appointment of Rick Williams to Chief Operating Officer in May. Williams was a former CEO at Central Oregon Trucking, which was acquired by Dasky in 2013. Other roster additions have included filling vacant CFO role with industry veteran Jason Bates and adding a chief information officer as well as a chief people officer. Dasky has been restructuring by consolidating some of the flatbed operating companies it has required, acquired over the past decade. Smaller and weaker performers have been rolled up into better run operators. Other initiatives have, in, have included the divesture of Avita, its oil rig transportation company. They also trimmed staff and disposed of some underutilized equipment. The company is also engaging in a share buyback program that will fund its executive compensation plan, something that they believe is completely necessary to attract and retain the management talent they'll need. And the streamline ops have led to stronger financial performance over the past two quarters. Analysts were expecting a modest loss in Q3, but Dasky posted EPS of 31 cents per share. Revenue did decline 17%, but that was in part due to the culling of equipment and resources tied to less desirable freight. But the company did post a consolidated adjusted operating ratio of 90.9. .9. That's up 6% uh, better than last year. And the operational improvement, debt deleveraging, an improved cash profile, and the potential for credit ratings and a lower cost of capital should allow the company to get back to its roots of acquiring other flatbed carriers, something that has been put on the back burner during this restructuring. Michael. 
Yeah, it sounds like they've done a, a, a yeah, Easter will be missed. He's done a he's done a great job, right? But uh, obviously, financially, they look like they're they're pretty solid moving forward. Uh, hoping the uh, the economy for them and and for flatbed and demand for flatbed uh, increases, right, or or stays well with the construction. Yeah, it should. Uh, given the 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 automotive production that we should have th- this year again over easy comps, but I saw Emit Maratra from Deutsche Bank is expecting twenty percent automotive production growth year over year. We also have Boeing uh, ramping back up production of the seven thirty seven and the seven thirty seven Max, and you have uh, oil and uh, and refined products that should be. Uh, up in high demand this year as well over last year. So you have some growth uh, prospects here in the next few months for Dasky on the flatbed side. Yeah, it's, it's definitely looking good for the flatbed demand for that market. It definitely is. The infrastructure bill might uh, be a boom for that too, if we can get that passed in 2021, get the industrials up, flatbeds up. Talking about operational performance, CapEx, you know, all of that, all those financial metrics gets me excited. You know why? It's earnings season. Earnings season is starting this afternoon. J.B. Hunt will be reporting after market close, and Todd Maiden will have those initial results out on on FreightWaves.com shortly thereafter. But we're going to ramp up. Heartland reported today as well. Um, but, but we're going to, to ramp up, especially on the truckload carriers, the LTL carriers. Uh, throughout this week and into next week, we're going to have a lot of action. So it should be – what, what do you think, Andrew? Um I think it's going to be a really good quarter for for reporting. It should. It should be one of the better better Q4s or, or better quarters in, in recent history. I mean, we had very strong demand throughout the quarter, I even finished on a strong note with consumer demand uh, pumping in through the, the back half of the year. I saw retail sales. I'm going to get into that here in a moment when we talk about point of sales. But uh, they finished up pretty strong, up 8.3% for the November and December uh, time frame. So, yes, carriers should, uh, if they're able to control costs and they were able to uh, prioritize the right freight and optimize their their selection, then they should have had a really good quarter. And we're about to, to find that, that out very soon. Uh, Heather Julian um, says, definitely getting behind the truck parking bit. I, I think we can all agree on that. Nico Brown is in the audience uh, too, saying, how's everyone doing this this afternoon? Eric Masadi uh, as well, the Vice President of Logistics over at Trailer Bridge. Uh, good, good morning from Florida. Love the show. So thank you very much, Eric, for, for tuning in. Uh, let us move on to Point of Sale, uh, your newsletter that you publish on Mondays and Thursdays on the retail uh, supply chain and transportation. What do we have? We, we have like, like really big news on a ban of imports, don't we, Andrew? Yes, Kevin, we do have some pretty big news. So the western region of Xinjiang is a major source of coal, chemicals, sugar, tomatoes, and polysilicon, but it's most notably known as the country's primary producer of cotton. In fact, the region produces 85% of China's cotton, and China accounts for 20% of the world's cotton production. So after months of mounting restrictions, the Trump administration announced a blanket ban over tomato and cotton products from the region, uh, and they cited allegations that they were made with forced labor from detained Uyghur Muslims. There's uh, reportedly over a million uh, Uyghur Muslims in the region that are being detained and forced to uh, produce these products. And this ban is robust. Uh, it gives the Customs and Border, Border Patrol the authority to stop imports that they suspect are made with raw materials from the region, regardless of whether they travel directly from China or through a third country, say, Vietnam. Apparel experts believe this ban has huge implications for the apparel industry. Scott Nova, the executive director of the Workers' Rights Consortium, a labor rights group, said this ban will redefine how the apparel industry, from Amazon to Nike and Zara, sources its materials and labor. He said that any global apparel brand that is not either out of Xinjiang or already plotting a very swift exit is is courting legal and reputational disaster. And this is a huge region for production. It's estimated that American brands and retailers import more than 1.5 billion garments each year using materials from the region, representing more than 20 billion in annual retail sales. And researchers have found that dozens of the world's most prominent uh, international companies source from the region, including Apple, Nike, and Kraft Heinz. Several firms like Patagonia and H&M have begun severing ties with the region to avoid and get away from the atrocities. But many others have found it extremely difficult to do so, given the lack of supply chain visibility from their Chinese suppliers. For this reason, even groups that believed in the cause uh, of the ban believe that it is too widespread to enforce. 
But in any case, this man is much bigger than just cotton and tomatoes. It is a call to action for all retailers to better understand their sourcing practices. Mark Morgan, the acting commissioner for the Customs and Border Patrol Agency, said that this order will send a crystal clear message to the trade community. Know your supply chains. Kevin. Yes, definitely know your supply chains. It's going to be very hard to do, very difficult. Um, but but we'll see how, how everyone adjusts going forward. Uh, what about holiday sales? What, what update do you have on that? Yeah, Kevin, despite retail sales declining sequentially uh, from October to November and then again to December over the past or the last three months of the year, the 2020 holiday season as a whole was one for the record books. Retail sales during the 2020 November and December holiday season grew an unexpectedly high 8.3% uh, over the same period in 2019. That is that beat the National Retail Federation expectations of about 3.2 to 5.3%. So uh, nearly double the mid range of that estimate. That 8.3% increase was double the 3.5% average holiday increase over the past five years, including last year, 2019's 4% gain. Included in that data is online and non-store sales, which were up 24% year over year. And there are two takeaways from me from this data. The first is that it's just further evidence of the resilience of the American consumer. Indeed, the stimulus checks and the lack of service spending that definitely padded wallets and allowed us to have extra money to spend in the holiday season, but that doesn't directly equate to spending. Americans chose to spend money on goods that lifted their friends and family spirits in the face of rising transmission from the virus, state restrictions on retailers, and heightened political and economic uncertainty. And then the second takeaway for me is that retailers were really able to influence the how and when shoppers uh, shopped. So in addition to warning customers to shop early and avoid potential shipping delays, retailers began running holiday sales earlier this year. It got kicked off with Amazon's postponed Prime Day to October that created uh, what many analysts call a 75-day peak season. That definitely played out. Retailers and transportation providers uh, were, not, were, were not only able to survive, but were to able to impress their customers this year. I spoke with Satish Dell, the president of Ship Matrix, and he told me that UPS and FedEx both posted on-time delivery rates in line or better than historical averages this year. And they were only able to do that through transparency from retailers telling people to shop early and, and, and inducing them to shop early. And it does seem that those habits are here to stay. I saw a recent survey from Cabay that says 44% of shoppers expect to shop earlier this year than they did last year. And my big takeaway here is that transportation providers should be applauding retailers' efforts to induce shopping in October or even earlier. An elongated peak season just means less congestion, fewer delays, better service, and a more delightful customer experience. Kevin. Thank you very much, Andrew. It'll be interesting to see how e-commerce goes through 2021, especially this first quarter. But thanks for that update. And really quickly, if you're not subscribed to the, the Point of Sale newsletter, how do you, how do you, where, where do you go to, to get subscribed? Yeah, it's really easy. You just go to freightwaves.com slash POS, uh, just your email there, and you can get uh, retail supply chain insights sent to your inbox on Mondays and Thursdays. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. The point of sale. So, uh, you know, Michael Vincent, let's check in on the weather yeah. real quick with, with Nick Austin and see what's uh, out there on the roads today. Hi, guys. We're definitely going to have a lot of rough weather for drivers out west. We're talking about the threat for heavy snowfall, some very intense winds and in spots as well. So let's get right to it. Here's the sonar critical events map. The Four Corners region is really going to be the focus for the rest of today, uh, especially across southern Colorado. We're also talking about southeastern Utah, parts of northeastern Arizona, and across northern New Mexico. This includes parts of Interstate 40, Interstate 25 as well, U.S. Highway 550, the Million Dollar Highway, uh, which runs from Colorado down into New Mexico. So through the rest of today, high elevations of those mountain areas getting up to another foot of snowfall. The winds will be strong enough to produce some occasional whiteout conditions too. That should all fade by this evening, but then later in the week on Thursday and Friday, some additional snowfall could come back to this region and other parts of the Rockies. No snow out in California, but the San Joaquin and also Sacramento valleys uh, in California, as well as the Sierra Nevada in the parts of far western Nevada, Areas of I-80, US-50 around Lake Tahoe. A lot of these areas are going to see dangerously high winds 
for the rest of today, some areas possibly tomorrow. In the valleys, gusts of 40 to 60 miles per hour. In the mid-range elevations, 60 to 80. And then gusts of 80 to 100 plus miles per hour in the high elevations of the Sierra Nevada and along the Sierra Crest. Just so absolutely um, just dangerous and really risky for drivers trying to deadhead or carry light loads through this area. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Just be super, super careful out there. High winds will also be an issue for drivers in Southern California, particularly the San Diego and Los Angeles metro areas over the next uh, couple of days with wind gusts in the valleys of 40 to 60 miles per hour, up to 80 miles per hour in some of the mountain areas. And there might even be issues for drivers in some of the coastal areas. Uh, but that should again die down in a couple of days or so. Now, stick with us. Later in the show, we're going to have a little fun. We'll talk about a new article that's up on FreightWaves.com talking about more worthy weather-related and natural disaster-related movies overall that truckers uh, can enjoy when they're not behind the wheel. So uh, join us later in the show, and we'll talk about a couple of those movies on the list. Wow. Sounds like you should be uh, refusing those uh, uh, potato chip loads and uh, Easter grass, lo grass loads that cross the Sierras this week, all right? <laughs> it, it does sound like that. I wouldn't want to, to be driving an empty trailer through, through there. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, stick to, I'll stick to reporting it. <laughs> well, let's check in on the freight markets with uh, Zach Strickland, our director of freight market intelligence. Hey guys, so we're still seeing, uh, you know, significant tightness in the United States. So tender rejection rates still up around 22%. Now they did drop for the first time uh, in a significant way since about the we see tender we see tender rejection rates come back down rather rapidly uh, after the holiday. As again, carriers come back online, drivers come back on the road. Uh, they dipped down yesterday below that 22 and a half percentage threshold that we've been looking. Uh, at seeing a kind of a stable structure forming uh, and volumes as well dropped for the first time significantly here in the last uh, you know few weeks so there's still some uncertainty whether or not this is going to be the beginning of an overall trend we talked about it last week with a lot of the uh, import shipments starting to show signs of weakness on the bookings end uh, but that's still a month away there's still plenty of inventory there's still lots of freight sitting on these ports Lots of freight available to move. And again, we're talking about relative weakness to where it's been. Uh, you know, we've had historic volumes over the last uh, several months from August through uh, Christmas. We're just now dropping below 24% on the outbound tender rejection index for the first time since August. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not like we're seeing this dramatic loosening. What we're trying to see if we can figure out is if this is going to be the beginning of some sort of significant capacity loosening. Uh, it does not look like that that's forming just yet. We're still up over 22%, 22.1%, which is the lowest value since it's been around August, since mid-August. So, uh, you know, there is reason for a little bit of, you know, is this going to be the big inflection point or not? But Again, 22% is still an extremely tight market. Uh, volumes are still high. They did drop pretty significantly yesterday, uh, and I say significantly in terms of relative significance. Uh, it hasn't taken this kind of a dip uh, since the you know holiday period when everybody was you know offline, uh, taking a breather. But it's not necessarily a dramatic softening. We're still 38% higher than we were in March 1st of 2018 when the index was created. So. Uh, we got a long way to go to see any real significant changes to spot rates, etc. But uh, a gradual change does appear to be forming, uh, and whether or not this is seasonal or not is still yet to be determined. Uh, there's still plenty of freight, like I said before, left to move. Uh, reefer tightness is still staying on on par with where it was last week. The van side is the part that's showing the you know the softness right now as we move into the latter half of January. Excellent stuff from Zach and Kevin. I don't know what it's difficult to predict which way it's going right now without some economic input and see what's going on. Right. You've got Chinese New Year happening mm -hmm. and and obviously that affects over the road transportation quite heavily. Uh, and then you're you're watching these volumes come down and and rejection rates come down off of historic highs and they're dropping to historic highs for this for this time of year right <laughs> yeah and they, they and they appear to be following seasonal trends 
but at a much higher level. So that's, I mean, that's when Zach, you heard him, he, he paused a little bit there because it's, is it or isn't it, right? Not quite enough evidence to call it that it's softening off of this incredible high or if it's just seasonality that's moving right now, right? That is exactly right. You, you don't know if it's uh, that natural kind of first quarter lull, which is at historical highs, just just like you said, Michael. And we'll have to wait and see, but it is driven by the, the economy and economic Absolutely. production. So, yeah, let's check in with Anthony Smith now and, and see his take on economic activity here in the U.S. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Michael. So today we're going to talk about two segments that got updated since our last touch point on Thursday, and that's going to be retail sales and industrial production. Starting off with retail sales, we saw that there was a 0.7 decrease from November to December uh, on a month to month basis. This is expected. This is something that we're really anticipating happening towards the end of 2020 going into 2021. But results overall are still up 2.9 percent year over year. When we peel this number back, it is a little bit more positive when we strip out gas prices, but still we have a decelerating trend overall. Even further, looking into some of the more particular segments of retail sales, one that's really been strong throughout 2020, retail sales for non-store retailers, so really getting into that e-commerce side, is going to be down 5.8% on a month-to-month -month basis. Again, this is still up on a robust level of 24.3% on a year-over-year -year basis, but we are seeing some deceleration on one of the strongest points of the economy throughout 2020. Now, again, this is something that we anticipated happening because of one, COVID levels really kind of hampering employment opportunities and regulations that have been put in place. Uh, another one being lack of stimulus um, or meaningful stimulus as of late. Uh, this is something that should be rectified for many going into the first quarter and coming weeks and or month here, likely with the new administration now being confirmed. And three, the other ones coming from employment levels that have really been lackluster, uh, especially towards the end of 2020, as we saw more COVID levels ramping up going into the new year. Um, going into the other segment that got updated, industrial production, we saw that there was an increase of 1.6% in December. So moving in a little bit of a different direction, we were really anticipating more momentum building into the manufacturing sector. So this is right along with our expectations and our projections. Um, however, this is still down 3.6% on a year over year basis. So there is some room for growth here. Again, COVID is going to be a, a really a big headwind for this segment when we're looking at overall employment opportunities and potentially backlog opportunities right now or precautions right now. So when we're looking at overall industrial production, there is some momentum building. Uh, one of the other areas to be mindful of is going to be commodity prices. That could be a really sticking point for a lot of production going on throughout the year. Those are the two big updates for today and looking forward to touching base with you guys all again on Thursday, looking at, of course, those initial jobless claims. Thank you very much, Anthony. So crystal clear right Kevin? economic uh, yeah crystal clear you know it's just like all economists will, will make it clear as mud right um yeah. but but it, it sounds really good let's check in on on e-commerce again we have final mile e-commerce from from andrew lockwood senior manager of solutions design here at, at south global logistics joining us uh to talk about what he's seeing in the market how are you doing today andrew what's going on guys doing really well i uh, excited to talk about some e-com and some uh parcel here. Perfect. Well, let's just jump right into it. How was uh, the, the fourth quarter holiday season um, from your perspective uh, with e-commerce and, and kind of the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if 2020 uh, taught us anything, it's to throw the playbook out the window. I mean, you've got the <laughs> NFL playing every every night of the week. Uh, it just feels like we all live in a laboratory where, where everything uh, tested or uh, you know, to, to see if it'll work. But uh, yeah, as far as fourth quarter, uh, you know, we saw, I think everyone in logistics had their challenges from a capacity standpoint, but especially with our e-commerce customers, we saw, um, of course, some shipping delays. So we had to work through with our parcel providers and uh, and certainly just from reading the news and, and understanding, uh, you know, where, where everything's at. I, I don't think we were the only one that experienced it, but it was certainly an interesting time. And what, that, what that's doing is that pain that was felt during peak season, we're now using that to plan uh, for 2021 to really get ahead of the curve, uh, just with, you know, with unprecedented volumes, especially 
moving through the small parcel and final mile systems. So a Andrew, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because it's, uh, uh, you know, obviously things were up and e-commerce was huge. One of the things we've talked about uh, many times in talk talking with Andrew and, and, and uh, uh, Anthony Smith here at, at Freightwaves and, and others is really when, uh, as the vaccine rolls out and, and people get to travel a little bit, uh, once they get more comfortable with that, there's a lot of people feeling, and I'm one of those, that the travel is going to come back with a vengeance. Because, as you said, it feels kind of like we're in this, this, this test in these, in these cages almost, and people are feeling that going to get out. What is that mix going to look like as far as e-commerce versus travel, and how does that affect that? that final mile. Do you have any insight into that or how are you guys planning for what is kind of, I mean, it's fairly unknown, right? It is. I mean, I, I don't think anybody has the crystal ball, but I, I do have, uh, I have three questions actually for you guys, buy or sell questions that relate exactly to that. Uh, I, I'm a big believer that I think some of the trends we're seeing here are now here to stay. And all COVID did was accelerate uh, some of this you know, even down to the RFPs and the, uh, you know, the requests we're getting from customers, I, I really have to believe some of these are here to stay. But, you know, I, I guess the, you know, question one for you, Michael, buy or sell, you know, the money back service guarantees. You guys are the know you talk to a lot of folks, money back service guarantees for UPS and FedEx were relaxed in, uh, in March and still haven't been there. Do you guys, what do you guys think? I mean, are, are these coming back? I, I'll give you my, my viewpoint after I, after I hear y'all. I don't think Kevin's there. So it, uh, his his uh, I think his audio went out for a second there. But uh, so you're asking me if the money back guarantees from UBS, et cetera, for service failures is, are going to come back? Are they going to come back? Yeah, because I, I mean, the, these haven't been in place since late spring. All the onslaught. Of yeah. Course. What do you think? I, I think once, yeah, I think that, well, they went away, right? Because uh, they weren't so sure that they could, that they could um, actually uh, fulfill those service standards, right? We saw some guarantee or some really good service uh, standards hit over the fourth quarter, but it was also due to a lot of uh, transparency and setting expectations, right? Uh, and that type of stuff, which I'm, I'm all for. I think that's great, especially moving forward. I think, uh, I think it depends on volumes, my friend, right? I think if cycle times increase and they feel confident enough to do that and they start seeing a drop off in, in some sort of uh, in the e-commerce, then those incentives would come back. But uh, I don't see anything right now that would cause them to need to put those incentives in place right this second. Does that make sense? No, it does. And that's that's exactly kind of where, I, you know, where I'm seeing Thing that as well it's it's a duopoly you've got ups and fedex and unless the incentives are there why, why would they do that uh they're mm -hmm. still trying to figure out how to, how to move all the volume through the system so to answer your you know your original question there travel coming back uh e-commerce i think it's here to say people are shopping online they they see a benefit there the efficiency of not having to go in the store uh, but it's it, it that part is here to stay and i think it, just like a river figures out where to flow the path of least resistance, I think other options are going to pop up too with, uh, you know, besides FedEx and UPS. Wanted to get your take on that as well, though, uh, from a from an overall competitive environment. Is it just going to be UPS or FedEx? Uh, will we see, will this be the year we see other, uh, you know, competitors pop up? Maybe not directly in the parcel space, but what, what are y'all's thoughts? Well, Andrew, let, let me ask you this question. Do you, do you think some of that has to do with um, the, the fragmented, uh, you know, the fragmentation with smaller shippers, right? Those online retailers that or might not be big enough to, to work with a major 3PL like FedEx or UPS or, um, or, you know, how does that play into whether there's more competition that pops up? Yeah, I, I mean, you hit a, you hit a great point there where, uh, from a from a competition standpoint, you've got customers that on a, on, on a Shopify platform, or they want to send an EDI or an email. So we're seeing all these different ways from a from an information transfer. Here, just take care of my shipments. Take care of the e-commerce yeah. part. Uh, and Kevin, what I'm noticing is this trend where uh, these smaller companies that are, that have an online presence, they're not necessarily going to the really large players because those players have an existing box and. You, you got to play in our box. Everyone's looking for some flexibility and customization with what that shipping experience is. And because of that, I, I, I'm predicting that this will be the year uh, where you'll see some, some different competitive um, shipping 
uh, you know, type operations pop up where it's going to it's going to provide uh, some opportunities and options in the market that aren't there today. I mean, let's be honest, there's there's been traditional parcel. And now with the, the acceleration of what COVID's brought, I think we're going to see some different things uh, by by next peak season to alleviate that. Yeah, I think you're right. And and you've got, mm-hmm. you know, we've we've seen Amazon and and others, Walmart imposing uh, these uh, fines for their vendors and actually firing some vendors and changing some things around. So even the competition to get in with these with the uh, the providers and the 3PLs uh, is going to step up. And I think there's going to be more people as they solve those those issues. <laughs> But I agree with you also, Andrew, on the uh, uh, that certain uh, most of I, I would I would I would go out on a limb and say the, uh, a majority or if not most of the changes in e-commerce or the increases in co- e-commerce will will change. Uh, I think the the thing that you'll see less of, obviously, is uh, not that it will change back to brick and mortar. But uh, there'll be a slight slowdown is those purchases that um, we saw took uh, they they took the place of those travel expenditures and the experience type expenditures, right? Like building a swing hinge in my backyard, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> right? Some of the I see some so that, of that slowing down, right? As you can spend spot- it up. Yeah, you're spot on there. I mean, you look at. Uh, you look at the sports and recreation bicycle industry. This was a, 2020 was a banner, and I'm not sure. You know, potentially 2021 could could match. You know, the volume and revenue that 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 specific industry did. But you're right. I, people are gonna. I, I think there is a, a desire to travel to get outside the house. Um, you, you see the national parks flooded uh, with people. So, uh, you know, some of those type of purchases for sure will slow down, but. Um, you know, I, one other thing, guys, that I wanted to, to share that I'm keeping an eye on that relates to that is, is shipping lead time, because uh, I think we've had a huge reset in the last year on what our expectations are. There was the novelty of the like the two hour Amazon, uh, you know, you click and click and it sets your door in two hours. Now, groceries, that's that's legit. That's always going to be a short lead time item. But uh, what I'm seeing in the marketplace and with some of these surveys is there's been a reset. So, for example, ShipStation had a survey uh, in that the average number of acceptable lead time days went from five to eight last year. Mm-hmm. So that's one number that mm-hmm. I keep my eye on is I think folks are getting a little smarter and savvier. They, they know that shipping's not free. Um, yeah. And in last yeah. brought that to the forefront. So depending on what you're buying, it could be, you know, it, 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 the difference between groceries and let's say a couch, that's, that could be an extreme example. But. Uh, but Michael, I think that that does kind of play. There's this yeah. general. Re- well, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, Andrew. We're running a little bit short on time today. Uh, let's, uh, you know, we'll have you on very soon uh, here in the next couple of weeks to talk more about uh, e-commerce and getting into the bulky, um, you know, larger than parcel type of, uh, of market. But but thanks for coming on today. How does our audience reach out and and learn more about setup and in yourself? Oh, for sure. Yeah, could, uh, be glad to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find our uh, our homepage at setup dot com. Um, of course, uh, my email is through uh, LinkedIn as well. But yeah, I would love to connect and talk logistics. Uh, lo- I love uh, knowing how things work. So, uh, would would love the feedback. Well, thanks for having Perfect. me on, guys. Appreciate it. You you bet. Thanks, thanks Andrew. Andrew. Always you know, Kevin, question. it was it was interesting. He brought up, uh, you know, groceries, uh, and and there's the other part there that has a big play in how uh, e-commerce and how the spending changes, right? Because when you start thinking about the advancements, not only was the acceptance of of e-commerce uh, pulled forward many years, five, ten, twenty, however many you want to argue, I don't, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not arguing the point. It mm-hmm. was brought forward. But so were the advancements in the technologies and the conveniences that uh, make that possible, right? Like now you've got home valet. Groceries don't have to mm-hmm. have to deliver it to your house exactly on time. They can be in a refrigerated or a, or, or, or a cooled box on your front door, right? People are mm-hmm. changing the way and the industry is changing the way the the pre-purchase experience happens on those larger items to reduce the returns, which reduces uh, stress and uh, improves the customer experience, reduces costs and returns, which 
makes it feasible and possible to keep those increases or, or those changes in, in purchasing to e-commerce for traditionally brick and mortar sales. So anyway. Yeah, yeah, there's some some really interesting trends and we're gonna probably see a lot of those play out even further in 2021. Uh, yeah. let's, let's check in on the hiring trends in 2021. We have new year, uh, a new outlook, uh, new administration. So let's see how that is uh, is affecting the, the hiring trends in in logistics with with Hunter Worley. Hey, good afternoon. Ooh. Good afternoon. What's going on, Hunter? Thanks for being on, my friend. Oh, it's good to be here. Good to be here. I, I believe I was taking a little bit of grief off of you uh, earlier, my friend, uh, because I had a charity event to go to. But you know, oh, yeah. Leave it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, tell us about that. You were going to come on uh, Thursday, but then you you called me back and said no, and I, I gave you some some hell about it. But uh, yeah. what's going on? What's the charity event? What are you guys doing? Let's plug them. Uh, so FPC National, our overarching uh, overarching company with sixty five offices, is partnering with No Kid Hungry, and it's a great organization. It goes to uh, helping those who are unable to have their children fed. Uh, being able to bring relief to them. Um, one of the things that a lot of people aren't really thinking about with the after effects of COVID is children counted on going to school for that for one to two meals a day. And if they're learning from home, that's not an option for them right now. So no, no Kid Hungry is looking to really get a lot more support in being able to bring nutritious meals to kids in time of need. So as an organization on Thursday, we're going to get together. If anybody would like to join us in supporting a great cause, look at nokidhungry.org. And there's ways that you can contribute there and learn more about the organization. Yeah, great stuff. And that is something that people don't think of. Uh, we discussed a little bit at the beginning, but then, it, you know, things fall out of your view and it's very, very important. That's a great point. There are, is a large percentage of children that count on that's going to school for, for their food, for their food that yeah. day, unfortunately. But yeah, thank you for that. NoKidHungry.org. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. Really good organization. Beautiful. So, Hunter, what's so going on in the world of recruiting, my friend? Uh, well, we've, we've seen a large uptick going into Q4. Talking to most of my colleagues across national, it's it's funny. We've, we've found some more perceived stability in the market. And you look at the director levels, you look at the uh, vice president level roles coming open. There just seems to be uh, a much bolder stance taken going into Q4 of last year and Q1 uh, 2021. Um, we can't always put our finger on why, but there were a lot of companies that were a lot bolder going into the end of the market or into the year in the market. Do you see that in a, a, a certain vertical like warehousing or, or you know, 3PL, freight brokerage, asset base? Do you see strength in, in, in any of those that outperform the others? Uh, 3PL, food distribution, and transportation have all been very, very aggressive. And, you know, common, common sense why. Uh, Third-party logistics and e-commerce has shot through the roof. Uh, those supporting groceries, food industries, they, they have been absolutely busy going into the end of this year. And they're really looking for the senior, senior help to help make, uh, make their processes and procedures a little bit stronger to carry them into growth modes. So, so Hunter, a lot of people are, have lost jobs or have been sitting around waiting as uh, there's some hiring slowdowns and now they're picking up that type of stuff. People are looking for those higher level jobs, the C-level jobs. You got advice for those people who are looking for those logistics jobs? What they, should they be doing to, to help themselves right now? I encourage networking as much as possible. And it's making time. So whenever you need a job, that is not the time to network. Throughout your, your normal business day, after work, you take some time, reach out to five or 10 new people on LinkedIn or on another site to where you are building your professional network. And one of the things I would say is people will get calls from, uh, from executive recruiters, executive search firms, and they just won't pick up. I've never understood this because if somebody was offering me a role that I make 10% more in base salary, I am looking at a new op or opportunity. Take the call. 
feel free to say no, it doesn't make sense. But people are still screening their calls very, 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 very closely. And a lot of times it's just to connect in the network and say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Michael, I believe that's the way that that's the way that we connected. I saw your background, reached out, and we ended up having a 20 minute conversation just talking about the state of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I talk to the people about that a lot of times. The importance, and I'm sure Kevin will echo this, uh, of 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 networking. You know, you we all know those people that they're around when they need something, but then they'll ghost you for for months at a time, right? And and it's not intentional. A lot of times, you just get busy. You've got to have that schedule of networking, Kevin. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's 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 persistence. You you have to, to keep on top of things. Hunter, what advice would you give to the people? Who are who want to connect to four or five different people, right? Um, what what type of messages or content works the best that you, you've seen in your experience? Hi, this is Hunter Worley. I noticed I noticed your profile on LinkedIn. Does it make sense for us to connect? Would you like for me to share some market insights that I have been seeing? And you know, no thin skins. Nobody's gonna. I haven't had any people reach out and say, no, I hate your guts. Don't ever reach out to me again. <laughs> At most, it's, no, I really don't want to connect right now. I'm busy. It's okay. But here's a funny story. I have a gentleman going in for an interview right now for a director of sales position. I spoke with the president of the company for the last nine months. We've just stayed in contact. And it's not, hey, you got anything for me to work on? You got anything for me to work on? No, it's, I want to understand what's going on with his operation. I want to understand his, you know, what, what he deals with in the sales side, what he deals with in LTL, because that's primarily where he works. And if I can understand his frustrations and we can talk business and we can talk industry, one day it's going to come down to, I know the guy that I have networked with for months. I know a guy who I've built a little rapport with. So whether you're a hiring manager or you are a job seeker, make those connections that make sense professionally that you can you can go back to and say, you know what, I know the one guy that I want to talk to, or lady, sorry, I know the person I want to talk to. And knowing the person that you want to talk to, that's, that's uh, it, it really is as simple as that. It is simple as sharing sharing intelligence with people. You share intelligence with people, that, that's how you network and that's how you, you build the, 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 the strongest relationships out there. Yes, yes. And somebody who understands your industry, uh, there are a lot of search firms out there. Look at somebody who understands your industry. If somebody says that they specialize in everything, they do everything, that means they specialize in nothing. The reason why I like working with distribution, logistics, and transportation professionals is I understand a good deal of what they are telling me as I have worked in the industry. I can help them out because if I wouldn't hire someone, I'm not going to put them in front of a hiring authority. It doesn't make sense. It certainly doesn't. You know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things, you know, I, I, a recruiter once told me a long time ago that you shouldn't really be good at getting a job um, because that means that you have a lot of practice at it. And <laughs> it's good to, to seek out advice from, from professionals like yourself, Hunter. Thanks. And yeah, we like to see that stability. Um, there are very few professional interviewers out there and there are very few professional interviewees. We spend so little of our time doing it that that's one of the things I actually enjoy is helping facilitate that process where I'm talking to the hiring manager and I'm saying, have you considered this? Um, what about this? And then reminding, a, a, on the other side, reminding someone else who may not have interviewed in the last five years, this is good interviewing etiquette. I'm not giving you the keys, you know, the, the keys to success to where you will own it. I am just giving you the basics of this is how, uh, this is how an interview is conducted. It's a good refresher. Let's go in there as positive and confidently as we can. Yeah. So Hunter, do you, do you, um, how, what kind of importance do you see in, in cultural fit, right? We talk about this all the time. I happen to think it's incredibly important. I know many people who interview solely on that is to get their final uh, candidates, not solely, but I mean, you know, the people have the right credentials, but they go for that cultural fit first. 
and and then into the more the expertise. What do you see there? Where, where's where's that kind of emphasis level? Good organizations are always looking at their cultural fit because you understand your team better than anyone else. And if there's going to be a point of friction, it's normally identified pretty pretty quickly with certain organizations. You've got some organizations that are a little bit more touchy feely. You've got some that are very very aggressive and upfront. But that organizational and cultural fit, I would say is one of the top three uh, differentiators for top candidates. And it comes down to, will you fit with my team? Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, uh, those cultural fits. Uh, so Hunter, how does our audience reach out to, to learn more uh, about yourself, uh, recruiting, networking, and FRC? Uh, you can you can reach me at uh, Hunter Worley W H I R L E Y spelled out nicely on the screen. Uh, look at, look for me at LinkedIn, F P C Riverwood. We're out of lovely Augusta, Georgia. And if you want to know a little bit more about recruiting in distribution, transportation, logistics, I'd be glad to have a short phone call with you. Just link up with me on LinkedIn, and we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you very much for your time today. Beautiful. Thank you, gents. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Honor. Well, Michael Vincent. Yes, well, Michael sir. Vincent, we have an exciting week of shows starting tomorrow with What the Truck. What do we have for What the Truck Wednesday edition? Uh, well, it, hey, what the, it's time for the ladies to take over, right? We launched our last Wednesday, uh, and it was all guys. Uh, <laughs> right. So, and this week is, uh, we got two huge industry superstars, uh, women, the ladies, the ladies take over this Wednesday. So we've got, uh, Melanie Wise, CEO at Fetch Robotics, uh, which is going to be quite interesting there. I love the robotics, especially in the warehouse, you know, Duner and I geek out over that type of stuff. We, we, we love to see that type of thing. So really good stuff there. And then Allison Barr Allen, who is COO and co-founder at, uh, fast, uh, fast log in, uh, checkout, uh, uh, software, which will be really interesting. So two, two techies, uh, women, big superstars, women take over Wednesday on what the truck, how about you, brother? What you Perfect. got going on? Uh, you know, so, so we have Thursday again with midday market update and great quarter guys comes on at 2 PM or no, I'm sorry, 3 PM today. Eastern Standard Time, Seth and Andrew will be talking about stocks, earning seasons coming up. So I, I imagine oh, yeah. they'll be previewing uh, earnings season uh, going forward. And then, you know, next Thursday, a week from Thursday, January 28th, we have the Sales and Marketing Virtual Conference here at Freight Waves. Where we'll be talking about sales and marketing with uh, a number of big names. We're putting together more speakers as we go along right now. So we have a full content. You can check that out live.freightwaves.com and upcoming events. And then we have the Global Supply Chain Week coming up, don't we, Michael Vincent, starting we uh, do it. February 23rd? 22nd, my friend. Day after my birthday. 22nd. I, I, it was it was, a, it was a risk. It was a risk scheduling it on the day after my birthday. Uh, but um, it, <laughs> just kidding, obviously. But yeah, the global <laughs> supply chain week, uh, the 22nd through the 3rd. So February 22nd through March 3rd. So uh, that's going to be everything global, right? When you talk about global logistics, air, ocean, geopolitical challenges and events in aerospace, uh, military, food, produce, uh Let's see, bans on cotton fibers from provinces in China, <laughs> yeah. uh, et cetera, right? The the whole gambit, but um, and separated by the, day. The whole gambit, and if you if you want to participate, if you if you're a technology company, you want to show off your tech, um, either in sales and marketing or the global supply chain week, reach out to me personally, K Hill, K H I L L at FreightWaves.com, or you can always DM me on LinkedIn because I love networking, just like Hunter was telling us. I love networking, so. Reach out, connect with me, and we will uh, we'll get you set up and, and talking to the right people to, to join with us on that. But that's a wrap today for the Midday Market Update. See you Thursday.